people, uh, depending on where you are in the world, um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Ronnie Cowley, and um, I'm from Toronto, Ontario, and I'm here to talk about uh, my tales of a sports writer who stutters. So thank you all for tuning in, and I hope you all enjoy it. Okay. You know, to get where you want to go in life, you need to adapt. In high school, I had no idea what I wanted to be. Years after high school, even, I still had no idea what I wanted to be. You know, a few months before she, uh, she lost her battle with cancer, uh, my mother was worried about my uncertainty with my future. I mean, as much as I wanted to find my own calling, to create my own path, I wanted to make my mother proud uh, and I still do, all these years later, even if she is no longer with us. Just as much, though, I wanted to make my father proud, and I still do, who is still with us, and my brothers, as well as the rest of my family. You know, being the youngest of my family, I was, uh, I was nurtured and protected more. This is also due to a stutter I developed as a young child, something that's been with me ever since. Also, since I was a young child, though, I was a big sports fan. Um, having been born a breach, um, and later being diagnosed with, with uh, cerebral palsy, um, I wasn't blessed with many athletic skills. But that was okay, though. That didn't stop me from loving sports. I was into baseball and tennis, but I took a special liking to hockey. Uh, helping, among others, my grandfather cheer on his uh, beloved Montreal Canadiens. And my grandfather, I picked up a lot from my grandfather, which may or may not have included yelling at the TV and a missed call by the referee or when my team lost a close game. All joking aside, though, I had acquired my grandfather's passion for reading and writing. While I dabbled in poetry and screenwriting, observational writing about something I knew and loved, like hockey, stood out most. You know, after a phase where I strive for industries with more opportunity and more income, uh, I found myself miserable and even lost. After countless conversations with friends, family, my therapist, and most of all myself, I knew I had to get back to what made me happy, what brought me the most joy, and that was writing. Uh, particularly about sports. You know, it all started um, way back when I was running mock articles on MySpace and then later Facebook. And then a few years, it turned to uh, running my own website about the Los Angeles Kings of the National Hockey League, uh, makewayforthekings.net. That, uh, and then time after that to getting to cover such events as the Stanley Cup Final, the NHL Draft, um, the Hockey Hall of Fame Induction Weekend. You know, looking back on all of this, I am very proud of how far I have come. And along the way, I've uh, befriended fellow fans and writers too. People who either didn't know that I stuttered or just didn't care. My writing is and always has been my escape. It was a show of run that wall. It may take me a few minutes to complete a simple sentence verbally. I can be the most articulate, eloquent, poetic even. When writing about, say, an inspiring story about a former player's battle with alcoholism, or better yet, about my own emotions um, on that balmy June evening in 2012, when the Kings, at last, uh, won hockey's holy... Hockey's holiest prize, the Stanley Cup. I look back and take pride in the relationships I've garnered, the friendships I've made with other fans, all the while creating my own voice. But at the same time, as great as all that was, I wanted more. In the summer of 2016, the Kings were about to enter their 50th season. Personally and professionally, I was going through a very difficult time. And if uh, nothing else, I wanted to be productive. Uh, too productive to think about what was going on in my personal and professional lives. Uh, I loved a job where I was treated well 
uh, to go to a job where, while it wasn't a running capacity, I was miserable. Not to mention, uh, um, in my view at least, mistreated and quickly let go for him. Uh, this left me feeling bitter and angry. You know, but, le but like, you know, while I certainly let these feelings get the better of me early on, I knew I could not continue this way for my mental need and my physical well-being. I could have felt sorry for myself, sure. Or I could have accomplished something I didn't think I could. And, and that was, in particular, interviewing people over the phone. An area which has always brought me a considerable amount of difficulty. The former was easy and the latter was hard. But, as the old adage goes, nothing worth having comes easy. So why not try the latter? To coincide with the team's 50th anniversary, I wanted to interview 50 former Los Angeles Kings players. You know, as a, as a child, I hate to admit this, but as a child, I look at something that was verbally challenging and say something along the lines of, too bad I stutter, and then move on. Not this time, though. This time I had hunger to redeem myself. But how would I do this? You know, I never longed for sympathy, but I did long for respect. But while facing my fears head on was certainly garnered the latter, I was more focused on uh, myself and how I would feel. You know, I was driving with my brother one day when he mentioned uh, the late movie critic Roger Ebert and how he used a voice synthesizer to speak towards the end of his life. Right away, I knew I wouldn't be able uh, uh, to afford something like this, but there had to be something similar. And remembering as the old adage goes, where there's a will, there's a way. Additionally, I mean, with the advancement in technology, especially with the phrase, there's an after that as common as it was, I had no excuses not to find an alternative method of communication. And especially, this, especially so when it came to interviewing others over the phone. So, it's so a little by little, I began search for, searching for former Kings players, interviewing them about their respective careers with the organization. I actually began using an app uh, that helped me. Unfortunately, it was very impersonal because it was an app with a robotic voice asking the questions instead of me. It required no work, no progress, really. Uh, uh, on my end in terms of verbal communication. So, you know, again, nothing worth having comes easy. So I decided to pre-record my questions and and uh, and to borrow an idea from uh, uh, fr from the Oscar winning movie, The King's Speech. I did so while listening to instrumental combat music on my headphones as I recorded my questions. You know, even at first with the stress and despair I was feeling during this time, I had difficulty even doing this uh, for a while. Asking my friends to recite the questions for me, he, to his tremendous credit, said no and insisted that I keep trying. And as hard as it was, I kept trying until I got it right. Even if it took a few hours or, more, or most of the day. And when I first started, it did take that long. You know, as liberating as this method was, though, and as thrilling as the interviews were, I will always remember the attitudes of many, if not all, of the players I had interviewed. Uh, since many of these players had such busy schedules, I put added stress on myself, thinking that I need to speed up my questions and my time with them. My concerns, thankfully, were unfounded. The anxiety I resurrected from my childhood when I used the phone, remembering those who impatiently try to, to finish my sentence, sighing in irritation, or worse, hanging up on me, made my speech that much worse. Yet, to my relief, none of these things happened during my interviews. It was both reassuring and comforting. The amount of former players who, emphatic, who empathetically rather, told me to take my time who waited patiently for me to finish my sentence. Even if it was to say something simple, 
like hello or thank you. You know, in hindsight, the experience of interviewing 50 former kings filled me with enormous pride, and it still does when I think about it. Knowing that I wanted to keep going, and I did, and, and, and especially as, as hard as it was at times. Looking back on it, though, I wouldn't, would not have it any other way. Being honored to have these players share their stories with me of victory, loss, and perseverance, both on and off the ice. I continue to interview those in the hockey industry today, um, including contributions to a prominent Canadian platform in CBC Sports. This includes past, present, and future talent. And I've especially enjoyed recently as managing editor of CaliSportsNews.com. I mean, partly to keep myself busy and to stay mentally healthy uh, during this time, the past few months of sub-isolation. A time which has been uh, challenging for all of us, to say the least. Also in 2018, I even overcame a personal fear of asking a question amongst the Scrum reporters. For a popular CBC radio show, I accomplished this by asking NHL Commissioner, the incomparable Gary Bettman, an important question upon his induction into the Hockey Hall of Fame. And I did it. And for someone who still has his insecurities stuttering around others, it was a tremendous achievement, to say the least. You know, for my sports writing career t to go the direction it did, to begin interviewing others, it all started with one morning. To have the discipline to get out of bed early, to stop feeling sorry for myself, and to do the work, which included research, reaching out to people, and slowly but surely turning this into a routine. Some mornings I just didn't feel like waking up. So, who does? I did it anyway. The work was one thing, but the fear of speaking to others, especially over the phone, was daunting. The greatest way to overcome your fears, though, are to face them. Sometimes it is very difficult to find the focus and the will just to get started. Believe me. But once you do, the rest is history. You know, that time period was one of the hardest I've ever had to endure. But at the same time, I could not let fear stand in my way. Fear can aid you. Fear can stop you from doing something that you know within yourself that you are capable of doing. Fear will paralyze you. And I simply had too much to offer to let fear overtake me. If you fail, try again. If you fail again, tr try again. Again. If you fail, try again. If you keep failing, keep trying. Take a look at all the success stories in all walks of life who, who have failed in one way or another. You know, you will find plenty, and I mean plenty of examples. Trust me. You know, when speaking about this, I think about all the times I felt lonely, ignored, worthless even. And, and I think about how far I've come and how I never let my darkest fears, my darkest moments, get the better of me. I have had days where I thought I didn't have much to offer. And at times I still do have those days, as we all do, you know, because we're all human beings. But, but what I want... I'll do what it takes to get it. You know, there's so many things that I would love to accomplish still. I'm running for a major sports publication, or a hockey team, or for the NHL. Or to interview uh, the great Wayne Gretzky, or uh, Mario Lemieux. Or active players like Sidney Crosby or Conor McDavid. To interview women in hockey, from players and executives to journalists. 
which include two of my favorite hockey writers, Helene Elliott and Lisa Dillman. You know, I may not accomplish these tomorrow or next week, but keeping these goals in mind keep me fresh. It keeps me driven to keep doing what I love doing. I mean, even five years ago, there was so much that I wanted to accomplish that people uh, said like, oh, sarcastically, good luck with that or that'll never happen. But, uh, but lo and behold, I did accomplish those things. So, uh, um, so I go in this with the same mindset. What I wanted to accomplish uh, for the past few years, I did. And what I want to accomplish now moving forward, I will be able to do. I may not be able to accomplish uh, each of my goals, but uh, but again, keep my mind fresh and keep myself motivated uh, will, will at least help me to uh, to get there, to, uh, to at least try my hardest. And, and at the end of the day, that's all that matters. You know, people tell me that breaking into the journal, into the journal and journalism, sorry, industry is hard, and I agree, it is hard, very hard. If it were easy, though, everyone would do it. But I have proven that if I am serious about this, and I am, that I'm not afraid to go all out. You know, I have had colleagues and classmates who have never bothered to get to know me because I had such a hard time speaking. You know, uh, I've had colleagues and classmates who treated me with the greatest respect. And, and, and to them, they know who they are. I thank them. But, but just sitting here thinking about all the, all the people who, who, who have ignored me, who, haven't, who didn't treat me seriously um, uh, because I wasn't the most fluent speaker, let's say. I mean, it's one of those things, uh, it hurts, part of me it hurts to think about, but a bigger part of me says, well, it, this may have bothered me 10 years ago, but it just, it, it doesn't bother me anymore. I mean, you know, maybe, I mean, these people talk down to me, ignore me, but, but it was these experiences that, uh, that fuel me for my own kind of redemption. The redemption of, and the risk of sounding corny, uh, living my best life. And pushing myself to be better, both professionally and personally. You know, there are those who don't like my writing. And there are those who just don't like me. I mean, that may be unfortunate to an extent, but, but that is, uh, whether you like it or not, a part of life. And I've never let that uh, uh, destroy me. I'll come back. Uh, and I'll come back stronger because of it. Because I always have. After all, as I've said earlier, all I long for is respect. You know, uh, not that I am thinking about this or that I want to think about this, but, uh, but when I pass away, whether that's 50 years from now, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's anywhere in between, I want to leave behind my own legacy. I want to be remembered as someone who had tons and tons of guts. Someone who did not let a stutter stop him from doing what he loved. This is what I stand for. I may have changed a lot over the past few years, but a lot has changed me. With each person I interview, I treat them how I want to be treated. You know, to thank them for their time to thank them for their input, regardless how long or short the responses are, regardless of how enthusiastic or willing they seem or don't seem. Thank them and appreciate them. After all, they are taking the time to speak with you, uh, or in my case, speak with me. And they don't, th they don't think less of me because I'm a person who stutters. And because of that, mostly because of that, that is why, uh, that is where, rather, a lot of my respect comes from for them. You know, doing what you love makes you, 
feel only as old as how you feel. Most days I feel like I'm much younger than I actually am. And that is never a bad thing to feel. I have had regrets, no question about it. But I have taken full responsibility for my choices, for my life. And while it took me some time, I'm not only accepted where I am, but I have embraced where I am. I have had many unpleasant experiences. Many. <laughs> some of which I mentioned already. But it doesn't matter what, what happened, happened to me yesterday. It doesn't matter what happens to you yes, what happened to you yesterday. What matters is what you're going to do about it. I am honored to have had the, inter the opportunity to interview and even get to know so many players, coaches, and executives. Some I grew up watching. Others younger than me, which I insist does not make me feel old. But in whatever capacity, I am determined to keep doing what I loved. I have only been introduced to the Saturn community in recent years, but it has made my life richer. It really has. Meeting people who suffer from all ages and all walks of life, accomplishing what they love, Achieving their dreams no matter what obstacles stand in their way. Serving as a reminder that you can accomplish anything, anything you set your mind to. These are the people who have inspired me to accomplish what I want to accomplish in spite of my stutter. And at the risk of leaving anyone out, I won't mention any names. But there are many, many names. And, I'll, and most of them know who they are. With all that being said, though, I do want to take a moment to speak to the children and teenagers who also stutter. First of all, I've been there. I know how it feels to be mocked, to be laughed at, and to be not taken seriously. Do not, I repeat, do not let this deter you. Do not let this get the better of you. You may feel discouraged, and you know what? That's okay. But the key is to use what you have to your advantage to be the best that you can be. It may take some time, and that's also okay. But just remember those who understand your situation. Those who will never mock you or laugh at you. Your family, your friends, uh, your teachers, whoever. And if you are in speech therapy, take it from me. Do not take it for granted. You know, as a child, while, while I did benefit from speech therapy, I always felt that I could have done more to help myself. Please take advantage of the opportunities for speech therapy and to get everything you can out of it, especially on days when it does feel like an obligation. And there are going to be days when it does. To Carol, thank you so much for your tireless work as my speech language pathologist when I was a child. I still remember your drawings of, among others, the cute little turtle to remind me to speak slowly. In recent years, I've registered for speech therapy and learned to appreciate it more than I ever had. Unfortunately, money became an issue and I needed to stop. Still, do not wait this long. Take advantage of the time you have now. And as best as you can, appreciate what you were learning. And what your speech language pathologist is teaching you, you will be better for it, believe me. You know, as much as I've accomplished over the last few years, I know there is room for, for improvement. I still long for the day where I can, when I can have more conversations with someone on the phone without feeling the need to press the play button on my app. But, like the goals I have for wanting to write for a major sports publication or hockey team, you know, uh, to interviewing the aforementioned Wayne Gretzky, I may not accomplish these right away, but it is nonetheless something that I'm working towards, something that I'm striving for, something that makes me feel motivated and hungry to just keep going. I sit here and I can't help but think about my first Stanley Cup final in one of my favorite cities, Boston, Massachusetts. In 2013, just two months after the tragic marathon bombing, I had arrived in Boston to witness the city and its people rising up, coming together as one 
stronger than they've ever been. I mean, even though I wasn't from Boston, I was very, I was very proud to witness that and to an extent to be part of that. My editor, in fact, was so thankful to have me cover the event that he gave my friend and I tickets to historic Fenway Park, home of my beloved Red Sox, to watch the game. It was, as a fan, one of the greatest days of my life. But covering the Stanley Cup final between the hometown Bruins and the Chicago Blackhawks was, as a sports writer, one of the greatest weeks of my life. It was, in my opinion, one of the greatest finals ever. And I do not just say that because I was there. I got to cover the NHL's first outdoor game in Northern California at beautiful Levi Stadium in Santa Clara. Home of the NFL San Francisco 49ers, I entered the, the beautiful new press box with walls covered in murals of the greatest 49ers. Joe Montana and Jerry Rice to Ronnie Lott and the legendary coach, the late great Bill Walsh, father of the West Coast offense. I could go on, but... Uh, you know, in my interviews, I had some great conversations with, among others, former Los Angeles Kings owner Bruce McNall, the man famous for bringing Wayne Gretzky to Los Angeles. There was also NHL legend John Tanelli, an integral member of the dynastic... New York Islanders of the early 1980s, the last team to win four straight Stanley Cups. We even shared stories about our fathers after I told them that my dad quit smoking the night Tonelli and the Islanders won their last Stanley Cup on May 17, 1983. I was privileged to speak with some of my favorite players growing up. Kelly Rudy, Lou Grobatai, Steve Duchesne, Tony Granato. Just a few months ago, in fact, a coach from the major junior Ontario Hockey League made a point of telling me just how much respect and admiration he had for me for conducting interviews and getting my stories in spite of my stutters, telling me to keep at it. And you know what? I plan on doing just that. I mean, while gestures like that are necessary, they are nonetheless appreciated. And for that, it made my day, my week, and it will continue to make my, my days whenever I think about this. You know, I'm not in this life to garner the most admiration or to make the most money or to attract the most social media followers. I am in this life to make the most of it, to make the most of my talents. I love telling stories and projecting my voice. And this is the best way I know how to. I love this and will do so until my final day. In closing, I want to thank each and every one of you for watching and listening. I hope you enjoyed my story as much as I enjoyed telling it. Thank you to Vikesh Anand and the Australian Speakeasy Association for allowing me this platform. I am honored to be included in this wonderful conference among so many amazing personal and professional stories. I wish all of you nothing but the best moving forward. Keep up the wonderful work. And no matter what anyone says or how anyone makes you feel, just remember, don't ever, ever, ever give up. Thank you.